Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another amazing edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. Do you have a difficult time as a dentist talking to your hygienist about how to diagnose periodontal disease at a higher level? Well, we created this podcast for you. I brought on Miranda Beeson. She's an amazing coach here. And we talk about five strategies to encourage dental hygienists to diagnose periodontal disease. It is awesome. Please listen to this. Please share this with your team. I promise it'll make your practice and your life better. So listen up. I know you guys will enjoy it. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam. Our job is to bring you the best thinkers, coaches, leaders in all of dentistry to help you create a better practice and a better life. And today we're going to be talking about ways to encourage. We're actually going to walk through five strategies to encourage dental hygienists to diagnose periodontal disease with one of our amazing coaches here. We call her the solutionist, Miranda Beeson. Miranda, thanks for being on. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I love it. Now, as always, like we have all we have all of our coaches are amazing in different ways and it's really really fun. And so, I'll share with you guys for you the, those listening. 2 days ago, Miranda says sends me an outline for the entire podcast. So, settle in. This is going to go for an hour and a half. You watch. No. <laughs> oh, so it's good stuff. So, Miranda, let's start here. Um well, actually, where do you want to start? Let's talk about the global issue, like the why. I mean, you've already done the intro many times. So, I mean, people know who you are. If you don't, I'm just going to, I'll do the intro for you. Miranda okay. Beeson is the solutionist. We saw her from the outside and she contributed courses. And I think we just watched her do her thing and we're like, we got to find a way to get her over here and working with us at some point, someday, somehow, some, some way. And you will experience that today. She is just a great thinker. She's worked, oh, I think you've worked in every position in the office. Except for know. dental assisting. Okay. But I fell down to the dental assistants. You guys have a hard job. Yes, Kudos. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So let's talk about the why before the how. What's the why behind this? Give us the why. So we all know how prevalent periodontal disease is and how impactful periodontal disease is on overall health and systemic health. And if we're not navigating our patients through that process and helping them to understand what their risks are, if they have the disease, how can we manage it? Are we truly helping them to the fullest potential? So when we look at the prevalence of periodontal disease in our culture, we know that over half of the population, depending on the data around people's age, has some form of periodontal disease. And as patients get older, 65 and up, we know that goes up into the 60s and based on some research, even the 70th percentile of people who have periodontal disease. And with the correlation we know now to so many systemic health risks, heart disease and diabetes and Alzheimer's and I think prostate cancer is in the mix now, there's so many things, patients are starting to become aware of that too. Right. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to support our hygienists, to make sure that they're comfortable and confident and helping patients navigate that disease process. Yeah, absolutely. And things have changed in the 25 years I've been doing this, as you've already seen with Bale and Donin, you know, beat the heart attack gene and all the research that's coming out. When I got started, you could say it might be, it could be, there's a chance it could be related. And now we have sufficient data and research to know that what's going on in your mouth is directly linked to a lot of what's happening in your body. So that's one of the opportunities there. The other opportunity is that this isn't going away. Anyone who's listening to this is like, yeah, gosh, I don't know, period disease just kind of dried up in my practice. I mean, it just kind of <laughs> disappeared. I think it's only going to be there longer. 
I mean, I, I, we could spend 30 minutes on the benefits of really understanding perio, but the other correlation that's fun to watch because I'm a data freak is that the more 4,000 codes you do in your office, guess what happens on the restorative side? And Bob Barkley said it years ago, back in the 70s, the more perio, the more, the more great work you do on that side of things, the more the restorative schedule gets full because people start to understand. They start to value and they move themselves up the value chain themselves within your practice. So there's multiple, multiple benefits of this, don't you think? Absolutely. You, If you're not diagnosing and treating periodontal disease in your practice consistently, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year are walking out the door. In right. periodontal treatment itself, as well as, like you said, building value and people start to get more inquisitive about their health and their oral health. And they start to look for more answers and how can I be healthier and better? And that feeds into restorative as well. So yeah. we're, we're leaving money on the table for sure. So from a business and profitability standpoint, if we're not doing this, the profitability isn't where it could be significantly. But then, yeah. you know, on the other side of that is we're, we're decreasing more and more risk for patients. And so that's where we have to balance because as business owners, you, you tell me I'm going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars more profitable. Hygienists, you better get out there and start diagnosing Vario. But the hygienists need to, they're not receiving that same impact that you are as a practice owner. So right. where it's really going to impact the hygienist is knowing the impact that you're having on your patients, who a lot of these hygienists consider friends after years and years of taking care of them. Totally. So, okay, so we all get this. Hygienists understand this too. They get excellent training. So this whole perial thing is not new when they get out into the world. Talk about the hesitancy. Like, where does the hesitancy come from? I think that it's twofold. Now, new graduates are going to be a little different than experienced graduates. So I'll tell a, a really short, quick story. When I first graduated, I graduated top of my hygiene class. I was so excited to go out into the world and be this hygienist and share all the knowledge that I had. And on day one, I remember having a patient and I remember thinking, wow, this is more than I can do in one visit. <laughs> like, this is perio. I'm pretty sure this is perio. Right. But I don't know what to do here. And I remember the dentist who was so sweet. He took me in the hallway and he was like, so are you finished with this patient? Like after the exam? And I'm like, I don't think I am. He's like, I don't think you are either. <laughs> like, right. There's a lot more going on here. And so some of it is a lack of knowledge, a lack of awareness of how do we navigate treatment planning, diagnosing, talking about this with our patients. And then there's also a lack of confidence. So right. it stems from confidence and knowledge. For those hygienists that are a bit more seasoned, it can sometimes be a, a level of complacency. Like we as a practice have never really made this a priority. Um, we have never really talked about our philosophy around perio in this practice. And I'm doing a good job. And a lot of times they're doing perio and not actually treatment planning perio. They're what? just working really, really hard. <laughs> what are you talking about? That happens so often. So often. Yeah. They're they're breaking their bodies, honestly, over delivering care that is more than what they're they're coding or, or presenting to their patients. A lot of hygienists are doing perio in a profi visit when the impact should be focused and deliberate so that also the patient is aware. Right. of the disease state and the risk that it has to them overall and their overall health. Yeah. You ever heard this one? They work so hard. They serve champagne, but they charge for water. Have you ever heard that yes. one? Oh, yeah. Yes. That's happening. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't want you to do that too. The other thing you're mentioning too, you, all of those, all of those conditions lead to a lack of alignment. So you might have hygienists that are all over the board on what they know and bringing them together as a leader is critical. You know, if you have one hygienist, it's usually easier to do, but then you had a second one and a third one, making sure they're all clinically aligned or at least philosophically aligned mm -hmm. to start is so key. And uh, it's powerful. It's powerful as an organization. It's powerful for them. It's powerful for you. It's really powerful for your patients. So yeah, I have a team that I'm working with right now. We just had a progress visit today and they have five hygienists. And it's actually two teams that used to work in separate practices and these practices merged. So you talk about like trying to get aligned. There's five different hygienists 
and they're coming from two different worlds in terms of prior practice experience. And so when we talk today about creating a hygiene priority and working through some of these ways to encourage them to align, one of the hygienists said, I said, do you find feel like this is going to be valuable to you? And she said, you know, yes, even just having time for all of us to sit and talk about hygiene, right. like we do hygiene all day, but we don't ever talk to each other about what you do or what I do or what works well for you. So just the time dedicated to having that alignment time, she was like that in itself is so valuable. Yeah. So, I, and I'll just, I'll just speak to the word alignment. Some of us skirt over the word alignment. We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so big in your life and your practice. Could you imagine you and your spouse not being aligned on where we're trying to go with this family? Oh, how about this one? What if you put tires on your car and the person says we should align them? And you go, no, 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 They don't need to be aligned. Or, I just did that. And I drove to Florida and I couldn't go over 70 miles per hour because my car was shimmying and I was really mad that I didn't oh, get that no. alignment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, remind me. I'm not driving with you <laughs> to Florida ever. So now, you said something though last week when we were at our two the top study club about alignment and alignment right. and agreement are not always the same thing, which I thought was so cool to say out loud. You can align with someone even if you don't fully agree. It's right. just a compromise that you're making so that you're all on the same page. You don't have to be in full agreement to be aligned. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And so it's not mine. I borrowed that from Lencioni. Consensus is actually deadly. To make sure that we're all agreeing is terrible. What we have to do is align. You know, even though we might not completely agree, we're going to align on how we're going to serve people, how we're going to raise children, how we're going to build an organization. Because if you're looking for consensus, you're going to wait for a long time and you're going to create this whole environment where everybody's got to be a praise junkie and everybody's got to be happy in order for us to move forward. The goal should not be like, let's all make sure we're happy. No, we're going to be aligned. We're going to get good. We're going to do everything for the right reasons. And as a result, we start to believe in the organization. So that's an important thing. Now, that's a whole podcast in itself. So, you know, I, I got to be careful what I'm interviewing Miranda because she's brilliant. It opens the doors for other conversations that, um, but uh, walk us through the first strategy. So if I'm a dentist listening, okay, listen, Miranda, this is a big problem in my practice because you just mentioned some big numbers on perio. Like my perio percentage is 3% in my practice or maybe 1% or 2%. Like how do I, what's the first step? What's the first strategy? Perfect. So I think the first one is providing opportunity for education and training. So like we just talked about, a lot of times the hesitancy isn't because they don't want to do a good job or they don't believe in perio or maybe they recognize they're seeing perio. They just aren't exactly confident or have the knowledge to really move forward with diagnosing and treatment planning. So creating that awareness and knowledge through providing opportunities. So bringing in continuing education into the office, doing things as a team internally or seeking out and encouraging your team members to look externally for opportunities to learn about periodontal disease and where it's going currently in our, you know, in our research. I know we have Katrina Sanders who comes right now this year, she's coming twice and the hygienists are going to get so much valuable knowledge and alignment through that program. So having the opportunities there for the team to grow and learn together, it's team building and it's align alignment driven, and it's going to help for them to have the knowledge, and the confidence that they need to feel comfortable bringing that up with patients and being able to answer the patient's questions when they ask them. Yeah, 100%. Two things. Number one, if you've never seen Katrina Sanders, you're missing out. She's so brilliant. And I hope when you see her, you learn her story because she comes from a practice called AZ Perio. Ralph, you're amazing out there. <laughs> what they do, no one does. Like it's so far ahead of the rest of the world and how they see perio. And as you can see, she's the chief like thought leader, verbal, like she's really gifted in so many ways as a presenter, as a clinician, but her verbal skills, I've seen a lot of people talk. Her verbal skills stop me in my tracks. I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay, just, you gotta say that one again, but say it slower in a way that I could understand that because that was brilliant. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, you can't, you can't learn that stuff on your own. She's all over the country teaching everywhere. So why would you even try? Put your hygienist well, in, in that yeah, room. There's experts that are out there like Katrina who are going 
internationally to learn this information. Right. You can't do that as a practicing hygienist working four or five days a week chair side. You can't go to all of the best symposiums throughout the country through, you know, internationally to learn all of these new processes. But you can find an expert or a couple of experts or mentors who are doing that and learn from them. They're teaching you through their learning pace. It's, it's, it's the whole community needs to come together to start to see that we can impact starting very small and go as big as we wanna go, but it's how much time do you have? And sometimes the teams don't have that time. And that's why it can be helpful to even carve time out where you're bringing someone into the office or, or playing some webinars in the office together as a team, but utilize those resources in the same way that you say, there's so many books in right. the world that we can learn from. There's so many people with a plethora of information. They're out there. We just have to seek them out and then carve that time intentionally to make sure that every year we're not just going online and getting our 15 free CEs, clicking through the videos as fast as possible and just answering the quiz because we already know this information. Seek out new information that might take you into a more mindful growth place in your career. 100%. Don't do it sporadically. Like it's a constant pulse of our practice. You know, every quarter we take courses together. We have a growth mindset here. You talk about the growth mindset all the time. Like one of our core values is always be growing. So if you don't like reading books, you don't like taking courses, this might not be the place for you, you know? So it also, you're going to love this. And Miranda, you didn't know, but before this podcast, if you guys go less, go and listen to the podcast before this, I interviewed our coach. Yes, coaches have a coach. Her name is Jamie. Jamie went through the five stages of change. And the last stage is called advocacy. Once they start doing it for their own reasons and we're all aligned on perio, systemic, that's when you sit back as a doc and go, wow, this is so fun. Like they're doing peer-to-peer -peer accountability. They are like taking it to another level. So I am so bought into what you're talking about, growing and developing people. What else do we need to know about that strategy? The other thing is, if this is something that's important to you and to your practice, then clear expectations from the beginning when you're bringing people on board that we have an expectation of you to want to be a lifelong learner. We right. have an expectation that you as a hygienist in this practice are going to stay up to date on the changes in the profession and that you're going to build those into your practice with our patients. Right. Yeah. You got to set the bar right there at the beginning, not later after they've worked there for two or three years and go, yeah, we're going to start taking courses now. No, we are in the cutting edge of what happens. Now, the other thing too, there's so many opportunities. All you have to do is look, no matter where you live, there are people flying into your town once a month on Fridays. You should be there. You should create a schedule where you go, no, we work Monday through Thursday and I make it a point. Some of the best educators in the world fly into your town. And I see dentists go, no, I got to work on Friday. You know, don't do that. Like spend that day after a really well-invested week learning and go into the weekend and go, man, I learned some great stuff today with my team. That's pretty yeah. awesome. It's so, invigorating for sure. And like it is team building. Like right. it's, it builds a lot of camaraderie amongst the team, especially if you do have more than one hygienist. And if you don't, before we move on to number two, if it's just one hygienist, doctor, go with your hygienist. Get aligned with your hygienist. You're both diagnosing periodontal disease in your practice. And if your hygienist goes and learns how to do staging and grading and starts building it into the practice, and you're not talking about that when you're diagnosing perio, now you're not aligned. So if you're in a solo hygiene practice, you don't have to do this alone. You can partner with the doctor when you're learning this new information about periodontal disease. Yeah, that's like, that's like the bonus round of number one here is most dentists, because I speak at a lot of these conferences, the hygienists come to the, by themselves to these courses and the doc is taking a bonding course, you know, or something like, like come on, there's so much learning together. Yeah. So good stuff. What's uh, what's strategy number two? So number two is implement a periodontal screening program, a periodontal disease screening program and have it be consistent across everyone on the team, on the hygiene department. So you can use your practice management software. Most practice management software, softwares, if not all, have a component that's a periodontal screening form or periodontal evaluation component. And so using that to its fullest potential and making sure that all of the hygienists know how to use it, how to share that information with their patients, and that you have a standard of care frequency documented 
for how often we're doing this and sharing it with our patients so that you're all in alignment. Right, right. Go back to the standard of care because that's another that's another phrase that I love, but it's misinterpreted sometimes. Like, what's a standard of care? It's so important. It's I, I think it's one of the key aspects, one of the major frameworks you should put in be day one. And your standard of care will change as you learn more, right? Yes, absolutely. And I know Heather, one of our other coaches, did a masterclass recently on, I think, the six essential systems for a hygiene department. And one of the things she talked about was standards of care. And I think she called them... Um, she has a patient who says he doesn't call them standards of care. He calls them like optimal care in our practice because standards of care are going to be different based on your philosophy of care. Right. Now, we know as a profession that there's standards around. We do need radiographs so that we can see things. But it doesn't really say how often you need radiographs. Most most offices are leaning towards their insurance frequency limitations to dictate frequencies and things like that. But what we can do as a team is we can decide for ourselves what's best for our patients. And so when we talk about our standards of care, it's what's the optimal care package that we're gonna offer for our patients? How often are we gonna update radiographs? How often are we gonna update periodontal charting and share that oral cancer exams, intraoral photos? Do we do them? If so, who does them? How often right. do they do them? And so that's built in so that anyone that joins the team knows this is how we optimally take care of our patients here in this practice. Yeah, don't skip over what Miranda just said, because if I came to your office, which I might do, just show up one day and go, okay, I'm going to ask a couple questions. How often do we do this? Does everybody get it? You're going to see like the look on everyone's face, like, I'm not sure. You got to get everybody aligned. Like even full periodontal charting. What is that? People, it's amazing how different the definitions will be. Can you talk about that? Am oh I going to awesome. do that? soapbox for me as a hygienist to to not have to to say that you're doing full periodontal charting every year some offices every two years but all i see is pocket depths so it's so much more than pocket depths we know that periodontal disease is involved much more than just that pocket so we need to be recording pocket depths we need to be recording recession so that we can know what our true clinical attachment loss is furcation involvement is huge and how is that developing or changing over time? Bleeding, separation, um, any risk factors, previously missing teeth. A lot of our practice management softwares, as the awareness around the, ex the robust nature of disease has become more aware, they have updated their systems to allow for us to input a lot of that information. And what I see most practitioners doing is pocket depths, maybe bleeding. But it's rare that you see all of those things. And if you're charging a, a DO-180, a comprehensive periodontal evaluation once a year with your patients, to do a comprehensive periodontal evaluation, we need to be looking at all of those fac factors and documenting all of those factors, not just the pocket. Because the yeah. pocket doesn't tell the whole story. No, it doesn't. And you mentioned risk factors. I mean, that's a huge thing. It's And the risks... There's more of them now than ever. You know, you've got diabetes, you got smoking, you got heart disease. You also have, you know, substance abuse now, which we, you know, you've got airway issues. The thing is, is that we are better positioned as a dental profession to be the most important group of people in anyone's lives. If you're willing to open your mind to that. I mean, think about that. This is when you transform yourself from a dental professional to somebody who really saves lives, improves lives. It's a different way of thinking, don't you think? Absolutely. And I know Robin just did a podcast recently, another one of our amazing coaches. And she was saying like a lot of times patients see their dental hygienist more than they see any other healthcare provider with right. consistency. So what we have as hygienists as an opportunity to impact our patient's health is huge. And so I, you know, that's why I sway away from it's just a cleaning. We're oral health therapists. We're yeah. comprehensive care providers. And so if we start setting our mindset that that we can be so much more to our patients than a mouth janitor, um, just picking at calculus, we have an opportunity to help them navigate risks that otherwise may have gone unnoticed for years. And right. that's why I like, so staging and grading is challenging. And then whenever I talk about staging and grading in the hygiene world, some people get excited. Most people kind of roll their eyes like, oh, why did they even have to change it? And yeah. I was like that at first too. So I get it because 
it was working fine. That's the way we've always done it. And there hasn't been any issues. But what I do love about staging and grading is they build in those risk factors. And I think that's something that really was missing from the way that we were evaluating periodontal disease and classifying it before. We're looking at missing teeth. We're looking at the, the rate of progression. We're looking at smoking. A1C levels, all of those risk factors that really have a strong impact on how quickly this disease could progress for a patient. And that wasn't something that we were building in consistently with the classification system we had before. Yeah. Now, if you're listening to this, you're like, yes, I'm totally excited. You will be excited about this journey, but it's going to be met with resistance. And Miranda, you said it like, that's the way we've always... The, you're going to run into the seven most expensive words in business. It's the, That's the way we've always done it. And part of it is you being consistent in the philosophy. Everybody can buy into it over time. Let them, you know, so... Uh, yeah, I say in the same way that core, we talk about core values being the filter for all of the decisions that we make in the practice. I think that your hygiene philosophy needs to be that that same beacon that helps us when we're starting to struggle through do I really want to put in the initiative I need to do here? Or is this the right decision? If we look back to what we agreed upon as a hygiene department and as a team is our hygiene philosophy, how we want to treat hygiene patients in this practice, it's a good beacon in the same way core values are to make sure that we're on the right path. I totally agree. Like you, you just, you just dropped the bomb. That would be a whole nother hour podcast. But what she's really, what she's saying, if you didn't hear it the first time is once you get your core values locked in, it's all about who we are. And now you don't have to think about the logistics. You just have to stay consistent. Like always be growing. Like all, all in attitude. Like give greater than get. And all roads lead home eventually to your core values. And that's how you can double down on some of these, you know, these concepts that you want to put into your practice. So it's good stuff. Let's talk about strategy number three. Number three is using technology to your advantage, using the technology to enhance your diagnosis. So radiographs are so important. And now those have been around for a really long time and not much has changed, but I will challenge the hygienist listening to incorporate vertical bite wings into their strategy and into their modality. So the number of times that I look at horizontal bite wings on a periodontal patient or a recare visit, and how do we know where their bone level is. We can't even see it. So again, thinking mindfully and not just checking the box of like, if I take a horizontal bite wing on a new patient and I can't see their bone, I might need to flip that vertically and get a different angle to really see what's going on to make a proper diagnosis. Right. So x-rays and photography, intraoral yeah. and extraoral photography is huge. And the more you can show the patient what is happening in their mouth, the less I have to talk to the patient about what's going on in their mouth. Let them see it for themselves. You mentioned um, Bob Barkley earlier, and I'm actually going to be talking about him tomorrow in my value course masterclass, but co-discovery. If the patient can see it and learn it for themselves alongside you, they're going to ask for the solution. They're going to want to know what do I need to do about that? So using those visuals can be incredibly helpful. Yeah. Some people don't even know what we're talking about. I actually have the original book, one of the original books he wrote. I still have it. Like it's, it's barely sticky, but what, <laughs> and I think it was written, I don't know, way back in the seventies, he was brilliant clinically, but what he really was a behavioralist, mm -hmm. like he really understood human behavior in conversations. It was so far ahead. Like, remember, I was in the 90s. For some people now. Oh, it, <laughs> so for sure. Back then. For sure. It was so, when you read any of the things that he ever wrote, you're like, wow, this is really brilliant and way ahead of his time. So I love Speaking it. Speaking of ahead of our time, the other thing about this is things like AI that are happening now. Wait, what's AI? Is that, uh, <laughs> whose initials? <laughs> No, I mean, you can't go anywhere without hearing AI, okay? Yeah. How do I use that in hygiene? So, you know, we have a success partnership with Pearl now. And I, like, my mind was blown the first time I saw AI in dentistry. So I'll do my best to describe it briefly because we could have a whole podcast on that. Um, there's a theme here today. So what 
AI does in dentistry, like a company like Pearl, is you take dental radiographs and it overlays artificial intelligence over top of that to help us to be able to see less subjectively and for our patients to be able to see decay and um, uh, open margins around crowns. And it actually can measure and show the bone loss around teeth. And so where before we would pull up x-rays and show our patient and they'd say, I don't know, it looks like toes to me, which right. happens so much more often than you would think it should. They can now look at it and they can see through color and imagery and um, there's line measurements that are indicated of how much bone loss by the millimeter. And so it, it does take some of the pressure off of the hygienist, the clinician, and allows for that software to be a bit more of the hitman in that conversation. And it's less me trying to sell you something, sell you this disease and prove to you that you have it. And the patient's able to look at that. And all you have to do is explain what does this imaging look like and let them soak it all in and ask you, well, how do I fix that? Yeah, a big part of helping patients, you know, move forward with comprehensive dentistry or obtain optimal oral health is you're selling the invisible. They often don't see this. And what AI does like Pearl is it takes the invisible and it makes it very visible and it takes the subjectivity out of it. One more thing, like every time I see Pearl, I freak out. I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, there's things that about AI that freak me out. But it's like, um, if you guys are familiar with this, semi-trucks right now, there will be a day there won't be semi-truck drivers. What's happening now that these trucks that have AI, they're all feeding one supercomputer. So by the minute, all of these trucks are learning how to drive better collectively. That's what's happening with AI. With AI, it's not just happening in your practice. It's happening in multiple practices over. So the software is learning by the minute to better diagnose and see what's really going on. And you, as a human being, can now just focus on the relationships and less of the, I'm not sure what I'm seeing here. So I encourage everybody just to, to it, and it also creates great alignment. You can't argue with this data. You can't go, I kind of see something different. You know? Well, and if you have more than one practitioner, more than one hygienist in the office, alignment was exactly what I was just thinking about as well, because I may look and see some shades of bone loss. There's horizontal bone loss that I may see that like, you're like, well, I don't really know if I would consider that bone loss because we look at things subjectively. So five different hygienists in one office may look at one vertical bite wing and have varying degrees of what they suspect that true bone loss to be. We also know that bone loss can be 30% greater than what we see when we're looking at the radiograph. And so if we all have this same tool in our practice and it's helping to measure that for us through AI, there's a lot less subjectivity amongst providers as well. Heaven forbid I diagnose perio and a patient doesn't come back to do it and they end up in someone else's room operatory next time and that hygienist is like, well, I don't know. I think we could just see you back in three months and see what happens. No, 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 no. Yeah. If we have those tools and alignment in place, they're going to have the same exact recommendation that I have for that patient. Absolutely. And as Miranda mentioned uh, earlier, they are a success partner of ours. I don't care if you use them or not, but you'd be crazy not to do a demo. So we're going to put a link down in uh, the show notes. Just check it out. You might hate it. I doubt it. But you'll see, wow, this is really at another level of how to see all of these things. You're all dying for something that would help everybody else engage in the conversation. Why don't you let technology help you? You know, this is where it can really help you. So I love this. Miranda, I got to know, what's strategy number four? Where do we go? <laughs> number four is fostering a culture of collaboration and communication making sure that we are creating a safe space within our practice for our team members to admit what they don't know and don't have confidence in, and that it is okay, and that we're gonna support each other in making progress and growth together. So it all starts with trust and making sure that we encourage our hygienists to come together and make sure that that confidence in diagnosing, it's okay to admit that we're not there yet when we're not there yet. It's a safe space. 
you are pointing to an incredibly important word. It's called vulnerability. For me to like admit that I don't really understand where we're at with this, it's powerful, don't you think? Absolutely. If we and we need to like celebrate that, you know, when I have a, a team that I'm coaching and I have team members that are a little reserved about sharing their voice, I always say put your voice into the room. And if they're feeling uncomfortable doing that, because that's a vulnerable thing to do in a group of people where you feel like I might be judged. Um, I celebrate those people when they do speak up and share like, you know, I don't think I'm there yet. I don't really know what you're talking about. Can you help me with that? Yes. And thank you so much for asking for help. Like yeah. I can't help you if I don't know. So if your team feels comfortable and you create a culture where being vulnerable is okay and they share with you, I want to be better, but I don't know how to get there. Great. Now let's create a space where we can collaborate together and get aligned using team meetings. Okay. Right? Wait, 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 wait. Or you, you pointed to the solution, but I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. I, we have, we have no time. There's no time to do this. Okay. So you you, the magic word. Not to do it. Okay. Wait, wait. What are you talking about? Team meetings to do this. Come on. Seriously. Like, do you know so how much I produce? Do you know how much, do you know how busy we are? Do you know how much more you could produce? <laughs> <laughs> do you know how less busy you could feel? <laughs> oh my gosh. Great answer. Great answer. That is correct. Yeah, no, that's that's so common. Like, how do you expect me to take an hour or two hours a week for me to close down my patient care and lose, right, lose that production to focus on something like this? Right. I think you can't afford not to. Mm -hmm. The way that you're going to progress and become more profitable over time to build a greater brand recognition for yourself about the way you care for patients is going to be committing to your team and committing to that time it takes to truly align around things like this. The alternative is you go on forever like you are, really busy, really frustrated, and not making any progress. Yeah, now there's a potential downside. You do these team meetings, you start, start talking about these. There will be a little like frustration. You'll be like, we've talked about this like 30 times. You know, there's gonna be discrepancies that'll show up and that's your opportunity doc, right? Can you explain that? Like, yes, what we absolutely. So when you have these meetings and these things come up over and over and over, don't get frustrated by this issue. It just means this is something we need to focus on. Now we are clear that yes, this is an issue in our practice. I thought, I thought we were on track. I thought our, our hygienists were good to go with this, but now I'm seeing that that's not the case. There's now a trend meeting after meeting that we don't know where we're going this with this or how to get there. And so building, I mean, you could hire a coach and we could help you. What? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, when you have those issues that come up repetitively, that's when an awareness should come about within you, yourself and your team, that this is a topic that we really need to drive some intention around. And that takes us back to like, number one, how do we, how do we get trained? How do we build the knowledge? What do we need to do? We need to take some action steps towards this. We can't keep talking about it week after week without coming up with some sort of solution or action step towards how do we make this better? How do we help our team get where they clearly want to go? Yeah. Now, obviously we are a coaching company. That is what we do. That is all we do. Now I'm just going to speak to the coach thing that you said. You can try doc. You can try to get everyone aligned. Just go for it. And it'll take you six to eight months just to do it. Where Miranda could possibly do it in six to eight hours because she's going to come in with a fresh set of eyes. And she doesn't just work with one practice. She's got a lot of practices that are amazing. They're not just dental practice. They're like the top of the top. And she's also seen hundreds of practices. So... You know, I love the idea of like, let's not try to do this on our own. When it comes to this, it's better to have somebody facilitate that. You're going to save time. You're going to save heartache. heartache. You're going to get energized by it. So I love that. So very well said. Let's talk about strategy number five. What do I do next after I've completed these four? So this might be my favorite because it's so actionable that people can really bite right into it. So establishing an agreement in your practice of what periodontal health looks like. If you can just start with collaborating together and defining what does a healthy periodontal patient look like in this practice? And then that becomes your bar from everything moving forward. 
So if we don't have health, you know, maybe we've decided that periodontal health means there's no bleeding at all. Or another practice may say less than 30% bleeding that's localized, right? Um, a, there's no swelling, there's no inflammation. The patient doesn't have risk factors. Whatever you decide the bar is for health, it should obviously follow suit with what we know through evidence. But there's going to be some level of variation based on your hygiene philosophy of care, right? Because yep. we go back to that as our beacon. But if we can define in this practice, health looks like this. Now we know every patient that passes through my chair that doesn't look like that is something else. It's some form of periodontal disease, but what is it? And we can go from there. Yeah, it's so fun because if you've been in any of these treatment planning sessions with doctors and they can't even are they can't even agree on pocket depth and what that means sometimes. So as it relates to your practice, now think about this. Here's the huge benefit. There's multiple benefits to this, but the huge benefit is that you're trying to get patients to understand how they compare to optimal health. And they can't get there unless the team knows how to do that. And so as a hygienist, I can never help anybody understand how that all works unless I'm really clear about what that means as a team. We've aligned. We know exactly how to do that. We, you can also borrow best practices. You know, so Moran, if I'm a new hygienist, I might shadow you for like a couple of days because I'm, wouldn't you agree? Like get us all working together and, and sharing what that picture looks like. Oh my gosh, yes, that was a great point. If somebody new joins your team, like absolutely. The step one is not like, okay, sit in the chair and show me how well you remove calculus. Step one is I need for you to understand as a hygienist in this practice, what our hygiene philosophy is. Right. Uh, Michelle over here has been with us for several years and she is an expert at helping our patients to understand our hygiene philosophy. I want you to follow her around for the next three days, grab a notebook, write down everything you can, all of your questions. And then at the end of week one, we're going to sit down and I want to hear what you saw and what you heard and what do you need from us to help you get to where Michelle is. Right. Even a line on codes, you know, um, the time frame thing, which you put in the pre-show notes, which I love. It's awesome. Like that's a big one. If I'm a hygienist, like how do we utilize an hour? It's amazing the difference in philosophy of how hygienists utilize an hour. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. The alignment and it needs to be documented. If it's documented, that helps any system that we have should be documented. But what codes are we going to be using? Do we use the gingivitis code in this practice? D4346. Is that something we're using now? Um, how do we determine if it's a 4341 or a 4342? There's guidelines around that quadrant versus one to three teeth of perio. Um, but how, how are we making sure it's clear here in this practice how we discern how we're going to treatment plan those codes? One of the muddiest codes I think there is periodontally is the 4355, the gross debridement code. And it's highly misused in dental practices. And so really getting clear, sit down with the CDT code book if you have like coding with confidence or, or something of that nature and pull out those periodontal codes and really get aligned around what they are, what they mean, and which ones are we going to use in the practice? Right. And then taking that the next step further to how much time do we need? How much freedom do we have within the schedule around how much time we need? Do we have blocks set aside so that after we build value in this periodontal care, the patient doesn't have to wait seven months to come in and have the treatment. We want them in within a month, if possible, while that value is really high in their mind. Right. And then how often are they going to come back for maintenance? Yep. Right. Are we going to come back in six to eight weeks and reevaluate? Are we going to come back in three months? Does the patient know that after they have this active periodontal therapy, we're not going back to free cleanings twice a year. We're going to be seeing these patients consistently, probably every three months, every 90 days, based on what we know about science and how often bacteria and biofilm reaccumulate. So we have to get aligned around time frame and codes and the processes and then document that so that everybody can return to it when they get muddy or lack of clarity around that or someone new comes on board. Yeah. And the danger of having Miranda in a podcast is that it turns into other podcasts because what she's saying is this, when you invest in these components, especially the last one you're talking about, it has multiple, multiple, multiple benefits. You're going to see patients get healthier. Your restorative schedule is going to grow. 
your hygienists become practice builders because now you're not running. It, you The bigger your practice gets, the more complex it gets. And what you have to do is make sure everyone's aligned. If I'm a hygienist, I got to be trained on who am I putting back in the schedule so that over time we are starting to build the right type of practice. Putting patients back into the schedule so that our hygiene you know, schedule is jammed for 13 months is not a good plan, you know? Um, also, like if you're a great restorative dentist and you're listening to this right now, you know this, you can't put healthy patients right back in the schedule. A healthy patient, depending on your philosophy, may come back once every seven months, once every eight months. I've worked with some incredible restorative docs and they're like, no, this patient only needs to be seen once a year. You decide that. But you have to convey that to the hygienist so they don't jam your schedule with people that are super healthy. You've restored them and there's nothing to do. We've got to talk about these things. And, oh gosh, I could go on and on and on. Every patient that sits in a hygiene chair is not great for the future of the practice. One out of eight, maybe not be great. And we're going to treat them with respect, but we may not stalk them to come back into the practice. And over time, I'm going to become an incredible filter for this practice. I'm going to put the right people in the right seats that fit our value system, that are right for the practice, that value what we do. And you as a doctor will go, this is crazy how cool this is. And I don't have to work in the confines of insurance. You better stop me before I turn this into a whole nother hour of benefits that happen as a result of getting aligned in hygiene. So, gosh. <laughs> This is fun stuff. It. As you can yeah, see, can. you don't have to show up at the beginning of the day and be like, oh, gosh, yes. that was, that was my schedule today. Yeah. So if you've been on this journey during this podcast, you're going to see we're CE freaks. We love this stuff. We eat this stuff up. So help us round this out. What final takeaways do you, have, Miranda, just on how we get everybody aligned in this department? Well, I think the easiest place to start is defining health, that number five that we just talked about. I think that's something that if you really take the time to calibrate with your team and talk about, it would be interesting for you to learn and see the differences in what people consider health. But it will also be a great eye opener for your team to, to start being able to talk about like, oh, I see it all day long now. A lot of my patients aren't truly healthy and there might be something more going on. They're going to be more motivated then to want to learn more about, OK, how do I treat those people that aren't showing up as health in my chair? But if you don't have it identified, there's no bar for them to measure that against. So that's totally. number one easiest thing to start right away. Yeah. And number two is it's not going to happen overnight. So if you're a five percent, you're not going to go to thirty five percent in a month. You're going to run out, run all of your patients out of your practice. <laughs> you got to be invested in the long haul. Wouldn't you agree? Like, be realistic. I mean, the bigger the practice, the, sh you know, the longer the turn radius is. You're not just going to turn this big ship around right away. We got to be invested that over time you see progress. How, how else would you coach? I mean, you coach some very big practices on this. Like, we've just, we've got to be okay with making progress every month, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I tell my teams that all the time. We're not going to just say you're at, and just to be fair to anyone listening, no judgment. If you are at 0% perio, you're not alone. If you're at 3% perio, you are not True. alone. A lot of practices, especially practices at seat coaching that we see start somewhere under 10%. It's very common. A lot of them under 5%. And that's why we're there to help navigate that. And I'm not going to set a goal for that hygiene team that's 30% at the end of quarter one. It's it's going to be uh, disappointing <laughs> week after week after week when they're not able to reach that goal. We need to make small increments. We need to see small change. So if you start at five and we end at seven, I'm going to feel really good and celebrate with you that you had a 2% increase. That's that many more patients in your practice that had access to better health care than they had a quarter ago, a month ago, however long it takes us to get there. There is no, how long will it take to get there, Miranda? I don't have a crystal ball and every team is different, just like every patient is different, but it's those small steps in the right direction that help us stay motivated as a team towards that goal that we're aiming for. Yeah, what you're saying is so true. I mean, the 2% has cascading benefits. Number one, your patients get healthier. Number two, your dentistry gets better, lasts longer. Number three, 
you know, you're going to look at the numbers in hygiene. You're going to go, wow. Number four, I mean, I could, I could probably do 13 benefits. Number four, you're going to notice, wow, we're starting to move away from PPOs. And I didn't even, that wasn't even the plan because now we're talking about value and Mm -hmm. people are more educated and this is more fun. Oh, here's another benefit. You're working slower. You're not running as fast as possible. And so, you know, when you do the right thing, you get really focused and you get everybody aligned. It's amazing how much better your practice and your life gets. Miranda, this is amazing. What, any last thoughts you have on this before we the say The last thing I would say is it's really important. We, we say at ACT, words matter, language right. matters. How we communicate is really important. So that would really be the last thing is how you're talking about periodontal disease needs to be another thing that you calibrate on. And you need to practice as well. We've talked, if you've listened to a podcast I've done before, I use the so that method quite often to make sure that the why behind what we're recommending is there first. So you can develop a few communication anchors or so that statements that your team can refer to and have a lot of consistency around the message with periodontal disease. And I think it's really important for every member of the team. Now they don't all need to know staging and grading, the business team, the dental assistants, they're not diagnosing. But a patient might come and sit down for a limited exam three weeks after having been recommended periodontal therapy and say to their assistant, you know, they recommended this like deep cleaning for me. I don't know if I really need that. And that dental assistant needs to have that consistent messaging about why and what and how that's going to be beneficial to the patient. So setting up some communication anchors um, within the practice that the business team, the assistant team, the doctors and the hygienists can all align around will be really helpful in the success of integrating these diagnosis strategies. Absolutely. This has been amazing. Here's, you know, here's an additional tip. If you're a dentist listening to this, this is the perfect podcast to share with your team and say, Hey, listen, would you guys mind listening to this? And in one month, we're going to have a meeting about it. You know, just, just let's talk about it because what Miranda put words to, you may not be able to, so don't try, you know, don't just consume podcasts by yourself. Get your team involved. Number two, if you've tried a lot of things, stop trying. Bring in a coach. We're here to help you. You know, pick up the phone. Like, we're here to help you every step of the way. What's really cool about this is the more you lean into this, the better your life gets. So, Miranda, thank you so much. That was freaking awesome. So, thank you so much. I always love being here. Yeah, it's awesome. We'll stick around. We'll say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. I love that you're showing up. We have crossed the 1 million download mark. And that's because you guys keep showing up. I am so crazy grateful. So if you keep showing up, we'll keep bringing it. We're going to bring the best minds, the best coaches, the best leaders, the best thinkers in all of dentistry. And we're going to share tips and tricks and thinking processes with you all the time so you can create a better practice and a better life. So keep showing up. So until you guys hear from us next time or you see us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Oh,